Hi, my name is Emily Bauer, and I chose to look into uh, the famine that took place in North Korea in the mid-1990s, and um, a famine that is also taking place currently. So, as I mentioned, in the 1990s, um, there was a major famine in North Korea, and um, starvation has kind of been a problem in North Korea due to its political structure, which I'll get to in a moment. But um, it's also, you know, currently taking place uh, because of this reason. Um, about 40% of North Koreans are currently undernourished. Um, to them, it doesn't seem like a huge problem because being um, undernourished or starving has kind of become the norm for them, unfortunately. Um, in the 1990s, I mean, the peak was in 1997 where the famine was uh, the worst, and uh, between 250,000 and 3.5 million people died. Now, that's a huge range, primarily due to North Korea being very private about um, sharing information and statistics about this, um, and just to give a perspective, they have a population of about 22 million people, so that's a pretty good um, chunk that, you know, were affected um, by this suffering. Um, the main causes of the suffering, first, um, North Korea lost uh, the Soviet Union's um, support or aid financially in terms of helping with their crops and um, giving the people food um, when the Soviet Union fell apart in the early 1990s. And then obviously just floods and droughts um, can cause a famine and then just a lack of support and aid um, to come back in and make up for those um, natural disasters or the, the lack of rain that they need to grow their crops and just that they have a smaller uh, growing season. And the government was uh, very inflexible in terms of, um, you know, going out of their way to help um, their citizens. In my research, one thing that came up was the was called the Arduous March, also known as the March of Suffering, and it didn't really seem like this was one event, although they described it being 20 degrees below zero, heavy snowfall, but essentially um, this is just part of the famine and hunger that took place in the mid-1990s. Um, but actually the terms famine and hunger were banned by the government because it indicated um, failure on the government's part and they didn't want to take any blame for the suffering that was going on with their people. In terms of the political um, context and what's going on, um, currently I think we all have heard about um, North Korea testing out their missiles and um, I think, you know, this is put a lot of countries, including the United States, kind of um, in a state of worry or kind of fear where North Korea is going to move next. Few people are allowed into the country. Um, Kim Jong-un is known for his elaborate lifestyle while his people are suffering. Um, they spend, the government and North Korea spends a lot of their money on their military and not so much as uh, money helping their people who are suffering right in front of them. And so I think that's something that is frustrating, I'm sure, for the people and just outsiders. And in North Korea, um, it's one of the worst countries for Christians to, I guess, be in contact with because they are so heavily persecuted uh, in the country. In terms of the impact, it's really difficult to comprehend or put a number on the number of people affected or hurt or dead because North Korea doesn't let a lot out of their country, frankly. Um, you know, there's been talk of cannibalism happening um, as more so in the 1990s as of um, instead of currently, but there's definitely fear, I can imagine, for the people, for the families, um, you know, maybe some uh, families are very protective over like food and possessions and who they're choosing to give their food to, who they're who they're choosing to help. Um, I would imagine they need to rely on their communities more um, as a source of comfort that you know the government isn't providing. Um, there's also a lack of medical support, so just instability um, combined with fear and just not knowing what the future holds. 
So honestly, if I was a North Korean citizen, I would likely put a lot of my blame for the suffering on Kim Jong-un just because um, of the lifestyle that he lives. And I'm not sure if North Koreans know about his lifestyle. I would imagine that they would. But I think it'd be easy to put a lot of blame on him. Um, I think also in this case, um, an easy, you know, theological viewpoint would be to say, you know, the devil's doing this, he's causing him to act this way, God isn't controlling what Kim Jong-un is doing, um, this is evil taking over, Satan has a role in this, and I think that would be probably the easiest to comprehend in terms of a Christian kind of worldview look at this uh, suffering. Um, you know, one question that I definitely had thinking about this is whether or not there's a way out for North Korean citizens. Can they leave the country? It doesn't sound like it's too easy. Um, do they want to leave the country? Do they realize the extent to their suffering? Sometimes you don't know until you separate yourself from the situation how bad it actually was. Um, one thing I read about is China has continued to support North Korea when the Soviet Union stopped supporting them. The famine got worse, but China kind of stepped in and, and helped a little bit. Not that they're solving the problem completely, but is it ethical for them to keep supporting North Korea when they are um, shooting off missiles and, you know, pissing off other countries and not cooperating in the political sphere? Um, I think that's something to consider. Um, Keller says that suffering is filled with purpose and usefulness. Um, I think that it's really hard to see the purpose and usefulness in this situation. And I think this is true for these types of large events of suffering that affect a lot of people. It's really, really difficult to find purpose. I think, you know, you can find purpose in smaller sufferings, like your grandma's death, um just smaller things in life, but when it happens on such a large scale, I think it just makes it harder to comprehend, and I don't think we necessarily um, always have an answer ready for that, but some of the tools that we've learned and just um, different views on suffering from the books that we've read can help us be more equipped to relate to different people who might be suffering.